This conference will now be recorded. Great. Well, welcome to Coffee with Nahara. Can everyone hear me okay? Thumbs up. Awesome. So for those who do not know me, I am Jana Borland. I'm the Associ Association Director for the National Native American HR Association. And for those who are with us for the first time, Nahara is a tribal-led nonprofit organization focused on the HR profession and tribal leadership. We are committed to members every day of the year as we truly understand HR and leadership. Historically, the association that started as grassroots efforts with four tribes meeting to network and share personal challenges and solutions, the meetings 27 years later evolved into annual conferences, um, and now we have certification programs, webinars, and summits. And speaking about summit, I just wanted to give a plug. We're going to be hosting a mental health awareness summit this May at the Palms Casino in Las Vegas. For information and to register, please visit our Nahara website. Uh, today, we proudly present our friends, Eddie Uko, Safety and Occupational Health Manager for the National Indian Gaming Commission, Aaron Eckhart, Executive Director of the Quapaw Nation Gaming Agency, and our Nahara 2022 HR Leader of the Year, Yay. <laughs> Lena McQuarrie, Director of the HR Quapaw Nation Downstream Casino Resort. In this session, they will review NIGC and Tribal Gaming Commission's role and preparedness. You will learn about IGRA and the NIGC Authority in Environmental, Public Health and Safety intersect through its interpretive role, the importance of effective team building, training and collaboration to achieve emergency preparedness. This session is designed to illustrate how tribal regulatory commissions and operations staff work together in response to critical and emergency situations. So excited and it's an honor to have you all here um, to share your experiences and knowledge. For those who are attending, please utilize your chat box if you have any questions. And before we start, um, I wanted to introduce Judith Bright, our president of our Nahara Association. Good morning, everyone. I'm excited to uh, hear this coffee talk. Uh, Eddie and I go back uh, quite a few years. And, you know, I'm very happy that we see a lot of the associations, NIGC, um, you know, just many of them that may not be HR related, but we work so much together, we collaborate together. And when we talk about these topics, many of these topics um, hit all of the industries as far as, you know, human resources, uh, regulatory, compliance, et cetera. So I'm always happy to support an organization and, and we're very thankful for the organizations that support Nahara. Um, I don't wanna take too much of your time because I know it's gonna be a very interesting conversation, but as Janet mentioned, we have the Mental Wellness in, uh, Summit in May and we also have our Nahara Conference in September. So I hope to see all of you there. Thank you. Without further ado, Eddie, we'll turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Janet and Judy as well. Thank you both for inviting me and uh, for this coffee with Nahara. I've got my coffee. I hope everybody else does too. I was able to sneak away before this started for uh, my little Starbucks run. It's pouring down rain here in Southern California. And uh, I was just talking to, uh, to, to Janet and, and Judy beforehand that uh, I got woken up last night from the rain. It doesn't happen in Southern California that often. So talk about preparedness. We're going to be getting into a little bit about that, how to prepare what's going on and all of the, uh, you know, the natural disasters and, and all of the potential issues that are happening around the country and to tribal nations. So first off, my name is Eddie Ilko. I am the safety and occupational health manager for the National Indian Gaming Commission. I've been with the commission now for uh, about a little over one year. 
Um, I've been in tribal gaming for the past 15 years. I got my start at Paula Casino Spawn Resort in 2007 as their risk and safety manager and helped build their program on safety, preparedness, and um, injury prevention and risk management as well. I then transitioned to Saquon Casino Resort and helped them open their uh, beautiful expansion. Um, I, I transitioned there in 2015. And in 2011, they opened a, a beautiful property, an, 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 ex, an expansion with a 300 room hotel, um, 100,000 square feet of gaming space, Lazy River, and all these uh, things that, that also have a huge safety component to it as well. And I was fortunate enough to come onto the NIGC, which, um, and I'll talk a little bit about the NIGC and, and what it is um, and how it, it, it was created. Um, once we get going, but I just want to introduce myself a little bit um, about that and I'll turn it over to Aaron and Lena to have them introduce themselves and then we'll get going on on some of our uh, conversation material we have. Aaron. Hi, good morning. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be part of this discussion. I love when regulatory and operations or any type of industry come together. I, I love that kind of collaboration. Again, my name is Erin Eckhart. I am the executive director for the Quapaw Nation Gaming Agency. Um, I got my start in tribal gaming after college. I started working in actually HR for a couple of local tribes near um, Northeastern Oklahoma where, where we're located. And then I got the opportunity to switch over to the regulatory side. The Quapaw tribe was building their flagship casino, their large property downstream casino resort. And so they were staffing for that build. And I got an opportunity to come work on the um, regulatory side. And I've been here for 15 years. So I've seen a lot of um, changes with the regulatory technology. And now I'm very excited to see that safety kind of has its own its own um, department with the NIGC. I think that it's great because we're learning things that I wish we would have known 10 years ago. So um, that's kind of my role. I'm Again, I'm excited to be here. I love HR. I love the tribal regulatory side. I love that the NIGC is getting involved with different associations and we're kind of all bridging that gap to kind of work together to a really cooperative effort. So thank you, Lena. Hi, yes. Uh, my name is Lena McQuarrie. I appreciate you having me today. Um, I actually work in the office next to Aaron. Uh, thankfully, they have their Quapaw Gaming Agency next door to us, so it's easy for our team members to get to their office and ours. They don't have to go all the way to the tribe, so that's wonderful. Um, I'm the HR director here at Downstream. I have worked here for 13 years, and I'm, I believe, running on three years as the director. Um, I too have learned so much. Um, honestly, when I first started here, I was IT part-time as a help desk technician. And um, from there, I, wor I worked um, probably about five, six months later from starting as the assistant in HR. So I've, uh, you know, I've gone through pretty much uh, every department, or I'm sorry, every position in the department rather than recruiting. Um, but uh, I, I've learned uh, so much. I didn't realize, you know, what we do isn't just, you know, providing uh, employment. You know, we we're we're able to do what we need to do in the right way um, with the guidance of QNGA, and you know, with that support, we're able to give back to our tribe, our communities. Um, uh, provide uh, services to our tribal people and its employees. So um, I'm, I'm thrilled to be here today and um, I appreciate it. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you, Lena. Okay, I will uh, get to our, just going to put our PowerPoint together here and share my screen for you so you can all see where I'm coming from. Give me a thumbs up. You can see my screen. All right, we got it. So we're here to talk about the NIGC and Tribal Gaming Commission's role in preparedness. Um, we introduced ourselves, and I want to talk a little bit about those four areas that you see on the bottom of the page there. And those are the four emphasis areas that our chairman of the NIGC, Sequoia Simmemeyer, has emphasized in the agency's work. 
So the first one is in industry integrity. That basically means, and, and what we focus in on is the valuable tool that Indian gaming is to protect the communities that create jobs, like uh, Lena was saying, because it's a life, it's like the lifeblood of, of tribal gaming programs. And it really creates opportunities for tribes to explore and strengthen those relationships in their neighboring jurisdictions. So that's kind of what the, the industry integrity portion of, of that means. The agency accountability, and that's all about the agency meeting the public's expectations in our administrative process in upholding good governance practices and support efficient decision making to protect tribes. So it's all about the relationship that the agency creates and has with those tribal gaming properties that they regulate. Now, here's the one that I hang my hat on and that I focus in on is preparedness. Now, preparedness, what does that mean, right? Because it's not just emergency preparedness, but it's preparedness in general. Um, so it means and it promotes the tribe's capacity to plan for risks, right? Because there's a lot of risks that can happen to a tribe and tribal gaming property uh, and to their assets, including, like I said before, natural disasters. You know, as you've seen across the country, the natural disasters that are happening, um, some man-made, some not. I mean, the, the recent uh, train accident that happened in Ohio, that's all over the news. These chemicals that are now infecting the ground, infecting and causing harm to people and injury, uh, you know, potentially for a long time to come. So how do you prepare for those kind of threats um, when it comes to, uh, you know, man-made disaster, but also natural disasters? And, you know, we've seen hurricanes and floods, earthquakes, especially in California. I mean, talk about wildfires wiping out hundreds of thousands of acres all over. Um, I can remember back in 2003 and 2007 specifically in the San Diego region where you would walk out of your of your home to go to work and you would see ash on your car and in the air because of how bad the fires were back then. So we had a kind of a notice of what was going on back then. It also talks about preparedness on the gaming operations workforce, right? Because we have a lot of people that are uh, in the business and we have to make sure we have a succession plan for the people that are going to follow us. So we have to make sure that we teach those people that are coming after us the things that we know now and the things that we've learned from the people that came before us so we can pass on those things to future generations. Um, and, and it's one thing that I learned working um, at, at the tribal casinos that I did for the past 15 years is have the succession plan. Teach and mentor people that are in your property, in your environment to make, you know, a better and prepared uh, industry. Public health and safety emergencies as well uh, is, uh, is, is a huge part of preparedness because if you don't prepare, right, you're, you're going to fail. And, and a lot of times we have to learn from failure, but if you're not preparing ahead of time, you're, 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 you know, the potential for you to fail is going to be that much higher on that scale of, of reducing and minimizing the risks that we all have and that we encounter every single day. And we'll get into that a little bit. And last but not least is the outreach. And I think that's probably why I'm here, a little bit of, of, of my job in the outreach. And that's to cultivate opportunities to ensure well-informed Indian gaming policy development through diverse relationships, accessible resources, which the NIGC has a plethora of resources on their webpage. Um, and, and we you know, work with others to provide their resources as well. Uh, so they can become better. And government to government consultation, because ultimately the NIGC is a uh, federal government agency within the Department of the Interior. So we take that very seriously. Um, so when we're dealing with um, tribal governments or tribal casinos, we uh, always have that in mind. So that's a little bit about those four emphasis areas um, that I just wanted to cover real quick. So next is covering um, IGRA's role in EPHNS. So IGRA is the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act, which was created by Congress in 1988. And this was uh, created um, in order to regulate Indian gaming um, at that time to make sure that there wasn't a lot of bad influences coming into the tribal gaming industry um, and to protect you know, the tribal governments and, and tribal members and uh, the business as well. So with that in mind, Congress not only created the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act, but they created the NIGC, the National Indian Gaming Commission. And that's where um, they created it to regulate tribal gaming. And in 2002, 
Um, this happened, the NIGC published what's called an interpretive rule. And the interpretive rule basically says that the commission's oversight authority in environmental public health and safety. Now, what it says is specifically is that the construction and maintenance of the gaming facility, right? How the facility is maintained and how it's built and the operation of that gaming has to be conducted in a manner which adequately protects the environmental public health and safety. So there's a lot to that statement and it's a very important statement because that allows me to go out to, when I do go and do technical assistance and provide training to uh, travel gaming commissions or travel gaming entities, that I can tell them this is where it came from. This is the authority that NHC has when we try and, and, and have consultations, when we bring awareness and training to the properties. So that's a little bit about that uh, interpretive rule, which I think is so important. And, and uh, by the way, if any of you have questions about that and, and how it relates to what you do, um, I think it's really important um, that since, you know, we are a tribal gaming commission oriented entity that, that, that we do reach out and have a lot of contact with, with tribal gaming commissions, that, you know, it's my responsibility also to have relationships with casino operations, because that's, that's where we bring people together. So it's not just about being in a silo and having these discussions with the, the TGRAs, as we call them, the Travel Gaming Regulatory Authorities, but to bring in the casino operations because everybody works together on this and preparedness covers everybody. Everybody has risks, uh, especially in the preparedness field. So when we talk about isolating um, some, some of these areas, we try and bridge the gap between those two, the casino operations, the Travel Gaming Commission, uh, and tra the tribal governments. These three areas need to work in kind of unison. You want to sit on the couch? So, uh, so the facility license also is a big deal. Is also uh, you know that and, and the facility license is uh, a document that basically is an attestation from the tribe that says this is the rules and regulations that we adopted in order to enforce environmental, public health, and safety at our casinos. So it's not the NIGC that comes over to the tribes and says, these are the rules that you must comply with. No, no, no. When I go out to a property, I ask the tribes, what codes, regulations have you adopted for me to help you, you know, meet those requirements? That's what it is. So it's very unique and it's very different across all of Indian gaming because everybody and, and all the tribes um, adopt different codes and different requirements differently. So it's a very unique experience when I go and, and I visit a, a travel gaming commission and I ask, you know, what codes have you adopted? And then they give me a list of them and, and, and that's the way we work together to make them better. And then I give recommendations on what I think can be improved on if there's any gaps involved as well. So that's part of the, the technical assistance and training that I provide as well. So the facility license portion is also a very important part and uh, there's a whole training on just that and what, and what property need to provide the NIGC because they are required to provide this facility license. And like I said before, different tribes have different rules on, on how often they provide that facility license. There are tribes that, that, that provide it once and then in perpetuity, that's all they need to provide. Others provide it every two years. Some of them do it annually, um, some of it every five years. Uh, I, of course, like to see it, you know, every two years or so, so we can update if there are any uh, you know, new rules or new codes or new regulations that have come about, they can adopt those so they can meet the, you know, the best in the industry, basically. Any questions on any of those issues? And some of the training and technical assistance you know, that we provide is not only on, um, on, on EPHNS and, and safety assessments, but I also do training on, uh, you know, unfortunately, on active shooter um, and workplace violence which I'm sure all you folks in HR can appreciate what, what goes on, you know, when, when there's a termination of an employee or when, when there's discipline of an employee, you know, how you make sure you protect the employees that work in HR, the gaming commission, and, you know, the guests that are around and, and how you can do best by trying to, you know, to help that individual be the best they can because they're going through a rough spot. So that's also some of the training and technical assistance um, last year, I was, uh, you know, honored with with coming out to the Nahara uh, annual conference in San Antonio, and I presented uh, an active shooter uh, pre and preparedness session there. Um, so these things are really important because 
Unfortunately, in, in, in our world, in our society, especially this year, just this year, there's been over 45 mass shootings since January 1st in the past two months. And that's probably a low, a low number. Uh, and a mass shooting basically means that it's, it's involved with, with killing four or more people. Uh, that's what they call a mass shooting. Um, if it's two or three people, then it's an active shooter situation. But I mean, it, it is just that I think there was a weekend in February where there was more mass shootings in one weekend than there has ever been ever recorded in our country. So um, that's why it's so important uh, to talk about preparedness and bring that active shooter issue up as well. All right. So this is uh, I talked about this before, but I thought it was worth uh, putting out there so you can read it and see it for yourself. And that's the uh, the interpretive rule for environmental, public health, and safety that I think is so important and doesn't often get talked about because this is where NIGC's authority comes from. Excuse me. And that's where they talk about the construction and maintenance of the gaming facility. You know, tribal gaming has been around now for it's it's celebrating its 35th year. And some of these facilities opened then or before, and some of them moved into other facilities. So some of these facilities are older, and we have to make sure that we're making sure that these facilities are meeting the safety standards that the tribe has adopted uh, for safety within the gaming facility, right? That they're maintained in a proper manner, um, that uh, there's obviously, you know, routine inspections of the, of, of the facility for the safety of the guests and the, the employees that are working there. Um, so they talk about the and the operation of the gaming conducted in a manner which adequately protects the environment and the public health and safety. So that's a big chunk right there. I mean, what does that mean to adequately protect the environment and public health and safety? I'm sure if you ask 100 people, you'll get 100 different versions of, 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 of what protecting the environment and public health and safety mean. But in essence, we're talking about making sure that the standards that and, and codes and regulations that tribes have adopted um, are being met. And in that is the training that uh, that I provide and that many safety professionals that already work in tribal gaming that I'm sure you know of. We're talking about security teams, we're talking about safety teams, and within the gaming commissions. There are many gaming commissions that have a safety person uh, on, on payroll, which is magnificent, which is amazing. Um, so uh, it's very forward thinking to have someone in that capacity that maybe has a dual role that look at some of the you know gaming portion, but also uh, focuses on on safety. So if anyone has any questions about this, please feel free to to chime in. You know I'm uh, free to take questions during this. Our next slide shows um, some of the uh, what most tribal codes require, um, and that's also in the interpretive rule. And some of that includes evacuation and emergency preparedness plans. I mean that is something that's that's huge um, because you have to make sure that if an emergency does happen that the employees know how to get out safely because not only are we talking about earthquakes and floods but power outages california is very well known for having power outages and blackouts uh, due to the energy issues um, going back and i remember i was part of the team working at a casino at a travel casino when the power outage happened uh, the power went out on, on one side of the casino and the backup generator failed and they had to use flashlights, basically your phone. I had to use my phone and everyone has a flashlight on their phone, how to light that up to try and, you know, light the path for our, our, our gaming, you know, guests to make sure that they got out. And I'm, it was gladly, it was during the daylight hours, but still it was stormy outside and um, things like that, that, that it's important that's in an emergency preparedness plan. And something I'm going to share with everybody a little later is uh, the agency, the NIGC last year um, published a emergency preparedness and response plan. It's about a 50 or 60 page document. And it's uh, basically an emergency preparedness plan that, that shows you how to create one and what to include in it. And if you all have one, Take a look at what we have, and if you have any gaps in yours, you can fill that in, or you can use ours um, and, and ask me questions. Please feel free to reach out. We'll, we'll have my um, my email address at the end here to, to contact you with any questions, because it, it says and talks about the structure of your tribal casino and the gaming commission, and who needs to be involved in these really important decisions when there's an emergency. Um, and I've talked to different people, you know, that, that have, you know, shared with me 
active shooters that have happened at tribal casinos, fires that have happened at tribal casinos, and how to respond to these issues. So preparedness is, is goes a long way because you don't know when you're going to need it until you need it, right? And it's best to have this plan, talk about the plan, get the people who are going to be responding and making the decisions and making sure that all the departments have someone that's involved so they can do their part. For example, just something as easy as having a designee from the food and beverage department to have bottled water on hand in case the, the lights go out. And there's no more refrigeration because the power went out, right? The food and beverage department is gonna be making sure that they're gonna go and protect some of their uh, equipment and some of the food that's in the freezers, but, but making sure that the water is available to employees and guests because you don't know how long that power outage is gonna last. So little things like that that come up during that preparedness plan that affects everybody. This is across the board. Some other things that codes require, we're talking construction specifications and building codes and maintenance codes and plumbing codes. Fire codes is a big deal, um, is, is most of those are required. The International Fire Code, um, things like that. Safety inspections, uh, most require that. Although not everybody and, and not all tribal gaming facilities and tribal governments have agreed to be um, inspected by federal OSHA. And OSHA is the Occupational Safety and Health Administration. Now in California, it's a little different because in most of the compacts with the tribes in California, they have compacted or agreed to have Fed OSHA do inspections unannounced. So at most of the tribal casinos have been visited by Fed OSHA unannounced. They usually show up in the morning, knock, knock, it's OSHA. We're here to inspect your facility, your hotel, your maintenance shop, your casino floor, you know, and they look for safety issues and they do uh, have violations that, uh, that, and they will fine you and they have fined travel gaming properties. In some other states that, uh, that, that don't have OSHA come on property, have other types of safety precautions. And it's really important that, that those codes be um, updated frequently uh, for those specifications. And that's where I come in too, and I can help those that don't have those type of inspections. And the level of assurance and safety. And of course, we talk about internal controls as well um, on emergency procedures. You know, backup and recovery. What comes to mind with backup and recovery? IT, right? Information technology, the servers, ransomware. My God, talk about uh, emergencies, right? There have been tribal casinos around the country uh, in the past few years that have had ransomware attacks, very serious ransomware attacks, and they have to, had to pay very steep, uh, you know, ransom to get their information back. Um, there is uh, insurance for these type of issues, but uh, they require a lot of money being spent on protecting your assets and your backup and recovery systems. Um, I'm not an IT guy. I, I can't speak to too much on the technical portions of that. But, uh, you know, it's, it's really important that uh, when you do uh, look at some of those issues uh, that uh, ransomware and, and your IT department makes sure that you're, you know, the team is trained on. Make sure you don't click on, on a, a link that you don't know where it's coming from. I made sure and I confirmed with Janet to make sure that I was pressing the right link for today. <laughs> so just make sure that when those phishing things happen out there that you're not caught off guard. And asset protection, of course as well okay and that's some of the things that we talked about here cyber incidents we just talked about biological incident we talked about with that rail incident that just happened you know it could happen on a reservation it could happen at a property um, earthquakes we see those we just saw one that happened in turkey and it devastated i mean talk about the, the lack of building codes in Turkey and what happened there, um, had they had the type of, you know, building codes and enforcement we have here that we're lucky enough to have, I don't think they would have had as much devastation. I'm not saying they wouldn't have had it, but I'm just saying, I, you know, I did read a lot of articles and, and, and did some research on this to, to see what it is that, and how those things happened. I mean, you saw some of the video and pictures of these buildings just coming down on people, um, frightening to say the least. So earthquakes are a big deal um, every year. In California, they do a California shakeout. Um, at, uh, it's, it's specifically October 17th at 10.17 a.m. Every October, every October 17th at 10.17 a.m., you do a, 
a, a one minute, you know, drop, cover, and hold on. So basically at that hour, you let everybody in the team know whoever's able or has an office or is able to um, drop to the ground, get under their desk or under some cover for 30 seconds um, until the shaking stops. So it's a good practice every year to think about that. And of course, there's always the fact that you never know what you'll find under your desk because you haven't been under there in the past, you know, since you've probably been working there. Um, and for the ladies who wear, uh, you know, high heels, I recommend you taking a, uh, a pair of shoes to work uh, and put away because last thing you want to do if there's an earthquake is either running in those heels or barefoot because there's glass and other debris that's going to be in your path. So make sure you take some other kind of shoes with you. Uh, that are flat so you can uh, get quickly out if you need to or get under the desk until it's safe to get out floods i mean talk about floods there was uh, some floods that happened in las vegas i don't know if you saw this last year last summer out of nowhere these torrential race rainstorms that happened and literally i saw the video the water was coming through the machines onto the floor it was that bad and just just there was like you know a couple of inches thick water that was just all over the place. I mean, this was just gushing out from the machines. Um, so you never know where that's gonna happen and then how you need to protect your team from floods uh, and water because that can create bacteria, it can create mold, it can create a lot of damage to your systems um, that you wouldn't necessarily think of. So that's always a big deal. Hurricanes and severe storms, we see more of those happening every single day. Um, you hear you know, all of the updates now from uh, the winter storms that are happening um they, they call them uh, atmospheric rivers um i know that uh, fema has a tribal liaison and and they were up in northern california talking to the tribes up there luckily there wasn't a lot of damage with those bomb cyclones and atmospheric rivers that happened uh but there was damage and uh and some have been more severe than others uh, specifically in california but in other states you know you saw the the hurricanes that occurred uh in florida last year and the damage that, that that could have technological we talked about power outage we talked about tornadoes and wind storms so just natural disasters in general does anyone have any questions on on any of this so far does you know i just it? have a comment eddie um when you go back to um the earthquake when i when i worked with my former employer um one of the um the items that they really focused on was on earthquakes it was the time of the san francisco earthquake back in it was it the early 90s yeah um and so uh, they they did a whole um campaign on earthquake preparedness for all of their properties and one thing that i never knew about is you know in california there's there's many modular offices and when we say get on top of I items um or get under items, I guess, like desks and stuff. Yes. Um, with a modular building, you have the jacks that come through the floor. So it's really get on top of your desk for modular buildings uh, because you have no threat of the of the uh, roof coming in as much as you would in a normal building. But that was one thing I, I learned that, I, that I'd share. Great, great point. Yeah, that's that you, you don't hear enough about that. So depending on, you know, if you have one of those modular buildings that you're actually have, um, make sure that you know, people are trained and, and you know, some of these codes that tribes have adopted require uh, emergency preparedness drills. You know, make sure that, that you're doing those at least once a year. And if you have a hotel and you have requirements from the fire codes that say that you have to uh, have a fire drill in the hotel every, every quarter, so four times a year. So check your codes, make sure you're, uh, you know, you're up to date on knowing what they require because different uh, jurisdictions require different regulations and codes. Um, so be up to date on that because you don't want to be off guard if there's been an update since 2002 and you haven't updated your code since then to the latest 2021 version because they're every few years are always updating uh, a lot of the building codes and fire codes um, and plumbing codes and, and things like that that often don't get talked about on this level. So I will, um, with, if anyone has any comments or any questions, um, I think I will uh, turn it over now to uh, to Aaron and uh, I've known Aaron uh, you know just a few months and uh, I've, I've worked with her on a few safety um, items and specifically um, in the NIGC's uh, fiscal year 2022 annual report uh, there's a safety spotlight in there and it was just released yesterday and I'll put it in the link here for everybody to uh, to, to check out 
uh, specifically pages 18 to 20, <laughs> which is a, a great snippet there about uh, uh, my visit there to uh, to, to Quapa uh, last November. So I will turn it over to Aaron. Aaron, good to see you, and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. You too. Thank you, Eddie. And again, I'm Aaron Eckhart, and um, thank you for having me. So what we do. Uh, we have two gaming properties. We have a large gaming property and we have a smaller gaming property. So we have safety protocols at both. But uh, what I wanted to mention first, because Eddie had kind of uh, shed some light on it about facility license, I just renewed the facility license for our smaller property. So when we do that, we go through the checklist. We make sure that all the codes have been updated to make sure that we have a list of everything. And we actually go do a physical walkthrough. And we check for things like the emergency preparedness, like Eddie spoke about, food and water, making sure that we have the codes for those and they've been updated, construction and maintenance to make sure that the newest building codes have been adopted, hazardous material, and that talks about paints, solvents, pesticides, cleaning agents, fuel, things like that to make sure that we have a toxic and hazardous you know, control code, sanitation, and then a few other um, EP, H and S regulations, and that's our our agency regulations for gaming. So um, we did just go through that. So um, we have sent that on. So that is part of what we do and make sure under um, the facility license regulations that we have to uphold. But just on the normal things that we have in place for emergency operating procedures are, are probably very standard. We have fire trainings, we have a fire code, we have fire drills, we have alarm procedures um, for our hotel and our gaming properties, um, elevator emergency drills because we have elevators. Um, bomb threats, we have training and drills on those. We're in an area where we're hit by pretty severe weather, mostly tornadoes, high winds, sometimes ice and snow, uh, power outages, utility leaks, um, hazardous spill and active killer procedures. We have something that's kind of neat that the tribe, the Quapaw tribe has an emergency safety director. So he sends out notifications uh, property-wide, entity-wide, if there's um, oh, severe weather, any type of active threats in the area, as well as known powder, power outages, which is really helpful. Um, and then on the casino employee training, we do, we've recently, which I was pleased that they started doing training on that, was the fentanyl. I know that that's been, you know, it's 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 a problem, and um, we need to we need to be prepared for it because it's a little unknown, I think, because depending on the the potency of the fentanyl, honestly, we've just had to have really good training on letting our people know that it, it can come here, we can find it, it, it we we could be exposed to it. We do um, CPR certifications and training because we have um, we have on our security team, we have EMS. We, they're also trained in EMS. And then at both of our gaming properties, we have the tribal fire and EMS on both located on both properties. So we have immediate response to any type of accident or injury or any type of threat. Um, We've hosted the Guardian of the Heart, um, I guess, their their annual conference multiple times, but they go through, the EMTs go through that training. We do, at our bigger property, our downstream property, we have armed security officers, and they also are CLEAT certified, so that's a little above and beyond what um, is needed, but we like them having that, um, that um, I guess, um, I guess it would be more of that um, training that um, I guess that it's more than that it needs to be, but we have them um, with that level of training is I guess what I'm trying to say. And then we have the fire department. They also have rooftop um, access training, which is really incredible. That's something new. Um, we have 
and again, we have our emergency procedures that we that we have um, that we train on. Um, we have a really good um, security trainer, and he stays on top of all of the things that we need to know and that we need to try train on that are immediate or sometimes even more specific to our area, whether it be issues with different types of drugs, different types of um, organized crime or gangs or anything like that. So he stays on top of anything that we would need to be prepared for. And then um, we our emergency preparedness procedures, we're always updating those like I said, to anything that might affect us in the area. We're in northeastern Oklahoma, both of our gaming properties. And another thing that we recently did tribal wide was partnership with um, the organization Stop the Bleed training, or Stop the Bleed. And what they come on site and it's an hour and a half training to where you become an instructor. So all of our employees and staff that went through this Stop the Bleed training are now certified as instructors. And what that teaches is tourniquet training in the event of a mass shooting or a shooting, active shooter, whatever that may be, or any type of, I guess, threat to the property, um, wound packing, and also direct pressure. Even though we have at both of our facilities, the EMS and fire, very in close proximity. Um, when seconds count, we wanted to make sure that we had that training um, property wide for our patrons and our employees. So that's 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 about that's all we that's what we do on the preparedness. But again, it's it's constant. There's something every day that we're looking into or making sure that we're prepared for essentially the worst. And we have to have plans, evacuation plans, plans for the machines, plans to uh, protect the tribe's assets in the event that an attack or a threat or weather were to happen. We have to make sure that at the casino that the assets are protected, the money, the, um, you know, just certain things that we have to look out for and have a plan for. Great, great points, Aaron. You're absolutely right. And these procedures, I mean, this is so important for everyone to see and, and take a look at what they are and, and how you'd be able to, from a gaming commission's perspective, you know, work with the operations. And uh, if Lena's on, Lena, if you want to comment on, on, on any of these things here as well. Yes, thank you. Um, I appreciate that. You know, <clears throat> Aaron makes, you know, some, some valid points on you know, why we're doing what we're doing um, for and for the reasons. So um, in what she had stated, prepare for the worst, uh, you know, that's, it's unfortunate to think that way, but, you know, if we have that mindset and we're prepared, you know, we're already a step ahead. Um, so any kind of training, um, especially obviously when it comes to safety, um, it is important, but, having that kind of knowledge and the skill base needed in that second in time that something happens um, is important because in an everyday world that we're in, um, we come to work every day, you know, we have our normal schedules. Um, we're not technically facing threats every day. So our brain only has a certain amount of time to reply and respond to anything that's threatening us. But in that moment, you know, we have to have that kind of knowledge and skill base to act on. So, um, you know, we appreciate everything that uh, QNGA provides, um, as well as anything that's um, extra to that in the training, you know, any kind of recaps or further discussions, you know, we're, we're constantly looking at how to improve our policies and procedures. So. Um, there's a few other things that I would like to add. Uh, obviously, we can't fit everything on this on our slideshow, uh, but we also have sponsored with what's called Rise Coalition. Um, they're out of Joplin and they provide training and a safe space for human trafficking. Uh, so we've had them here multiple times to train our hotel employees, our frontline employees. 
um, even back of house, um, in order to see what those red signs are, you know, how to respond in the right way, not to cause a scene, um, you know, in the and what we say uh, a lot in these cases is see something, say something. And that umbrellas over a lot of these trainings or anything that, um, you know, we have to correspond with and compliance. So, um, you know, we, we're constantly trying to find different ways to be better um, in order to provide the best services to not only our employees, our guests, um, our tribal members and businesses alike. So. Um, I'm thrilled to be a part of it, but it's a consistently, we're, we're learning and evolving as the world uh, also does the same. So um, we've, we've done the best that we can. And we're also talking, you know, to other, other tribes, um, other casinos, you know, when we go on trainings or any kind of conferences, you know, it's really nice to pick brains and see how they do things and why um, in order to bring that back to our property. So um, we're, we're, we're thankful for Aaron's team and, uh, it's, it's a consistent bonding partnership. So, uh, uh, we definitely need one another to, to succeed in that realm. So we're, we're, we're grateful. We feel like we're in good hands. Thank you. And it is such a partnership between the gaming commission and HR because we don't hire, but essentially all the positions are contingent upon a gaming license, a key gaming license. And what we do in the background checks we run and the applications we can have are for licensing. So we're outside of that, what we're restricted to on the employment side. So it is nice to work together to make sure that we're hiring the right people in the right positions to make sure that when there is preparedness needed or there is an emergency we have those trustworthy trustworthy individuals like i like i had said earlier like with the security that are armed they don't have to have cleat certification is the word i was looking for but we do that because we want to make sure that they have the industry standard or the best certification or credentials so we have trust in them to make sure that our property is protected You're absolutely right, Erin, and you both talk about how to protect your, your, you know, the industry as a whole and individually where you are, your gaming commission, and, you know, working together with the operations. Uh, you know, that, that human trafficking portion, Lena, that you mentioned is, is something that's, you know, being talked about a lot right now because there is a heightened level um, of awareness now on what human trafficking is, um, sex trafficking, labor trafficking, that has the potential to, to happen now that uh, a lot of the tri me, tribal gaming facilities have hotels and it may attract this type of clientele so it's important to train the the casino floor the the the, the public facing team members to know what to see and how to and what to do if they see the red flags of, of human trafficking uh at, at one of our um national training conferences coming up uh next week in miami we're having it at the Miccosukee Casino. We're going to have a, a, a session on human trafficking, on, on uh, combating human trafficking and best practices uh, in the industry. Our vice chair, Jeannie Hovland of the NIGC, is going to be on the panel that I'm going to be moderating. We're going to have a, a person from the Department of Homeland Security. It's called the Blue Campaign, and they focus in on combating human trafficking. And we're going to have a representative from the Bureau of Indian Affairs and my good friend uh, and former uh, co-worker and former boss, George J Jenkot. He works at Firekeepers Casino. He is the director, or I'm sorry, the vice president of security and surveillance uh, there as well. So he's going to be on that panel uh, next Thursday. So the NIGC has put together a full panel or a full day on preparedness now at their training, at their national training conferences. And I'm really proud of that and looking forward to talking about preparedness and uh, you know, human trafficking and uh, the NIGC's authority when it comes to EPHNS, like we did this morning. So I want to open it up uh, for any questions for any of us. We put our uh, our, our information here to, to reach out and give us a, you know, contact us, send us an email, anything we can provide, uh, we will do that. Eddie, I just, um, I have, I, I thank you, all of you. It's I couldn't write enough notes. Um, 
But there was something that you brought up, Eddie, and I and I would love to see if you would be able to share with the group is that you have a document, a 50 page document that if we needed some guidance on a, on a checklist or what to look for, do you have that capability to share that with us? Yes, let me, uh, so I'm going to stop sharing so I can get to uh, that if that's okay. Everyone has uh, this information. You can take a picture of it, take a screenshot. Um, and you can always reach out to Janet or myself. I'm on LinkedIn and Facebook. So I'm going to stop sharing this here and I'm going to go and, and find that for you all. But uh, go ahead and continue the conversation while I do that. And, and Lena, thank you so much. I, I really do recommend that um, who is on the call right now, reach out to Aaron and reach out to, to Lena. They have life experiences and I, and I'm, um, I, I know them, they're just full of knowledge and email them and pick their brain. They, I mean, you guys have done so much for your property um, and um, the RISE Coalition, um, all this training is just so important to have. And, um, oh, let me share this to the group, um, Eddie. Yeah, sorry, I'm, I'm trying to find a way to, to share it with everyone. I, I sent it to Janet by accident, there it is. You know, okay, through let me see if I can send it um, out to everybody. Yeah, this link will tell you, this link will take you directly to the uh, to the document. Everyone get that? Okay. Yes. Okay. Awesome. Um, I have another question. Um, and this is um for Eddie as well. When it comes to to training, you have offered um to reach out to you now. If I don't work in a gaming entity and I work, say, for tribal health, I work in tribal government, would you be able to assist all the other entities as well with checklists and emergency preparedness? Absolutely. Our resources are available to anybody, but when I come and do a site visit, it's primarily for uh, the tribal gaming facility, and that would be requested by the Tribal Gaming Commission or by the tribal government for me to come out and, and do an assessment. And it's by need uh, because there's only one in my department right now. So, uh, you know, we, uh, we take those and, and we prioritize them, but uh, definitely I can share, um, you know, any checklist because we do a, an EPHNS checklist as well that, that provides you kind of a, 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 a way of uh, going around and check marking. Okay, do we have our emergency preparedness plans? Do we have our training and is it in writing? Do we do we uh, you know memorialize the fact that they, the, uh, the employees are signing up that they were trained on on uh, on chemical awareness on hazard communication on fall protection on you know making sure that they know what their rights are and, and what to not to mix one chemical with the other because if you have housekeepers or GRAs as some people call them um, they need to know what chemicals they're using when they're cleaning. The bathrooms when they're cleaning surfaces when they're cleaning slot machines and what not to mix with others and how to store them properly because god knows sometimes people store things that shouldn't be stored together which cause combustible fires potentially so things like that that you know are, are in this checklist and i can put the checklist on here as well janet i can uh the checklist if, is is that would be so awesome helpful. the checklist is so beneficial and so helpful and i can speak and eddie had spoken that we had the assessment we were lucky enough to get eddie to um come do an assessment with us in november and it was such an such a insightful experience that we all learned and we all had a great takeaway from it and i just feel like we're better prepared to have better preparedness, right? Like, I think he bridged that gap and he really explained, um, I, I didn't know that 
uh, ladders had expiration dates. I had no idea, but now I know. So I'll never forget that. So it was just one of those, he made it fun. It was very interactive. Um, we learned so much and that was such an exceptional, you know, training event and that checklist, we use it. We've, we've, um, we've implemented it in our checklist that we do for our audits. And Eddie, will you be able to share that with us? Yes, I'm trying to, to, to copy it and, and put it in the uh, chat here, but uh, having a little issue here going to it. But we'll see if, it, uh, if I can do it. No, I'll have to send it to you, um, Janet, and then you can send it to. Yeah, this others. is my email for everyone. If you would like a copy, because I, um, for those who are logged in, I can see some of your email addresses, but some I can't. So I'm gonna add my email. If you're interested, please shoot me an email and I will forward it over to you. That's my email address. I think that would be the easiest way. Do you think so, Eddie? I think so, definitely. I'm gonna send it over to you right now, Janet, and maybe if, uh, if that's possible, um, share. Excellent. Excellent. Well, we're coming to our time here. Um, we're at 12.58, my time. I'm Eastern, so 9.58 Pacific Standard Time. Um, if there are any comments, please feel free to utilize the chat or if we get off the phone call and you forget and I'm like, oh man, I, I should have asked this question, please forward me your email um, and I will forward that email to, to Lena, Aaron, and Eddie. I, once again, on behalf of Nahara, wanted to thank you all for sharing all your knowledge and experiences. This is a topic that we can speak for days, right? And it's really an important issue. And I love what Aaron said is, you know, Eddie makes it fun. Um, he is a great person and it can be a bit intimidating when you have a safety person come to your property, but he makes it really educational, but yet ensuring that you have all the proper tools that you need. And once again, wanted to thank you all so much for joining us at Coffee this morning. Absolutely, and Janet, I sent you the, uh, the, uh, the EPHNS checklist through email, so if you uh, put it in the chat now, if you can do that, that would be great. If people want to just hang out for a minute, I think we have another oh, it's minute a left. Word it's a Word document, so it what is. I'm going to, um, yeah, so what I'm going to do is, if you're interested, please shoot me an email, and I will share this with y'all. Great, Excellent. thank you. <clears throat> I appreciate your time and um, this was truly an honor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day. Be safe. Thank you. Thank you, you all. Well. Stay safe. Nice to see you. Thank you, Janet, Aaron. Lena. Great job. Welcome. Do you want to hold on, Aaron, Lena, and Eddie? Sure. Yeah.